Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today, we will be presenting a webinar on Do Not Forget the Feed When Educating Patients About Diabetes Management. This is brought to you by the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And my name is Fida Pinea Sandoval, and I am the TTA manager here at NCHPH, and I will be helping facilitating today's webinar. So before we get started, these are just a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Um, all participants are muted upon entry. Please make sure that you engage in the chat if you have any questions or any concerns or any promising practices that you would like to share with us today regarding this topic. Um, also raise your hand if you would like your line to be unmuted during our Q&A session after the presentation. This meeting is also being recorded. And the slides and the link and the recording to the link will be sent via email after today's session. So for today, we will be doing a few um, interactive activities. And for that, we're going to ask for the audience to go to Mentu.com. That is the platform that we will be using, which is called Mentimeter. So if you can go to Mentu.com and enter the code that we have on the screen, which is 11556794. And the information will also be posted in the chat. So we're going to give everybody just about one minute to enter that information. You can use your computer or your smartphone or your tablet to do that. Okay, so hopefully everybody had a chance to enter that information. We're gonna move on to the next slide. So before we begin, a little bit about our organization, the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Our mission is to strengthen the capacity of public housing primary care grantees and other health center grantees by providing training and a range of technical assistance. NCHPH is a project supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration and is also a national training technical assistance partner that is 100% financed by this grant. The information presented today are those of the author only. So here we have some background information about those health centers that are close to public housing. As of 2021 health center data, there were 1,373 FQHCs that served to 30 million patients. 458 FQHCs that were also in or immediately accessible to public housing that served to 5.7 million patients, and 108 public housing primary care grantees that served to 1,911,683 patients as well. So this is some other information regarding public housing demographics, and this is all information obtained by the 2022 HUD Resident Characteristics Report. As of 2022, there were 1.5 million residents in public housing with two persons per household. 32% of those households were female-headed households with children. 91% were low income. 38% were disabled. And in terms of race and ethnicity, 52% were white. 43% were African-American. 26% Latinx, 19% were elderly, and 36% were children. And now I will pass it on to Dr. Jose Leon, who is our Chief Medical Officer, who will be going over our learning objectives. Thank you, Fide. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, Fide, Dr. Leon, you're muted. I am not muted. Can you hear me? I can, I can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Fide, before I forget, there is uh, a participant asking for the closed caption. I'm not sure whether we have closed caption for today's webinar. Unfortunately, we do not have the closed caption option on for today's webinar, and we apologize for that inconvenience. Um, All right, thank you, Fide. And good afternoon, everyone. It's such a great pleasure to be part of this conversation again. Uh, we are a national training and technical assistant partner, and we are supported by HERSA to provide training and technical assistance to community health centers 
as you know, uh, diabetes has been a priority for the last six years for, uh, for HRSA, for HHS, and we've been through the last uh, three years uh, hosting some webinars, uh, some diabetes web webinars on different uh, topics or subtopics. So if you are interested uh, in one of these uh, topics, you can go to our website, uh, nchph.org where you can find everything that is related to diabetes and social determinants of health, diabetes and nutrition, diabetes and cultural competency, diabetes and health literacy, diabetes and new technology, diabetes in the Hispanic population, diabetes affecting all vulnerable populations. So again, this is a really good opportunity just to go back and uh, if you have anything that you would like to know, uh, specifically for the population that you serve, if you, if you are close to or immediately accessible to public housing, we have plenty of materials that you can review. And today is not an exception. We are going to discuss a very important topic. And uh, first, we are going to have a brief discussion on why people with diabetes or people experiencing diabetes have problem with their fit. Then we are going to summarize tips for foot care and we are going to review a checklist, a checklist for foot examination. Next slide, please. When we talk about diabetes, we know that this is a huge issue, not only in the United States, not only uh, it's not only affecting low-income populations, but let's take a look at uh, what health centers are reporting through the uniform data system. In the percentage of patients with diabetes is about the same for all health centers, including those uh, health centers, the 330E health centers, as uh, well as the 330I health centers. But when we see the, or, or when we analyze the numbers of those health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing, the percentage of patients with diabetes is two times higher when you compare them to the other uh, health center, the 330E and the 330I health centers. Next slide, please. So I was talking a little bit about that diabetes is an epidemic. And since COVID, we introduced a new topic uh, or a new word, or in case you were not familiar, uh, in my opinion, diabetes is not an epidemic, it's a pandemic. It's an epidemic because we have it here in the United States and we discuss it, what is happening in, in the continental US. But in reality, it's an issue that is affecting patients all over the world. We can talk about diabetes uh, incidence and prevalence being high in Europe or in Asia or in the uh, Southern Hemisphere, Africa, Central and South America. So this is something that we need to pay attention to because in addition to be a condition that is affecting the entire world uh, population is also sometimes a condition that uh, patients are not aware that they are uh, being affected by diabetes. And moreover, many of them have prediabetes and uh, they don't know it. And they have no idea how they get it or how they're going to deal with uh, the condition because since they are unaware that uh, because they do not have any symptoms, uh, there is no, uh, the patients don't uh, go to the health centers. Uh, we're talking about populations, low income populations. We're talking about uh, some vulnerable population, people who have more than one uh, job. They have two or three jobs. So for them, access to care is something very difficult. So, Let's let's take a look at what we can uh, what we can do for our patients. In addition, diabetes is a condition that goes with other comorbidity, comor com comorbidities. Uh, we have patients with diabetes and hypertension, 
uh, we have patients with diabetes and any other chronic medical condition. So uh, the polypharmacy issue is also a big, big concern when we talk to uh, when we talk about patient experiencing diabetes. And uh, one of the things that I would like to highlight here is what we have at the bottom of the slide that um, the polyneuropathy or the diabetes polyneuropathy is the leading cause of, for disability due to foot ulceration, amputation, gait disturbance, and fall-related injury in patients experiencing diabetes. Next slide, please. So, Diabetes is a complex condition, and our patients need to learn a lot. And sometimes it's overwhelming for patients to learn about signs and symptoms of the disease. They need to learn about how to eat healthy. They need to learn when and how to exercise. They need to learn about the medications that they are on. And then we were just talking about the uh, polypharmacy issue in patients with diabetes because they experience more than one condition. So they need to learn when to take this medication, when, do they, when they don't have to take this medication. And then we talk about acute and chronic complications. We talk about uh, hypoglycemia, which is, is a big concern, or hyperglycemia, and all the uh, complications that are related or linked to diabetes. So there is a research I was looking at, and um, is the, according to the research, we forget about 80% of what we learn in 30 days. So if we are not talking to our patients, if we are not going over, is what, if we are not emphasizing uh, some of the needs and some of the complications, patients are going to forget it. Especially if you have a patient who you see every three, every three months or every three, six months because they come to the diabetes uh, uh, exam and, and, and they want to know the A1C result. So this is overwhelming for anyone, especially and if, on top of that, you need to add the health literacy issue, whether or not the patient is able to understand what you're saying, whether or not there is a barrier uh, uh, issue uh, the, because the patient doesn't speak English well. Uh, so all are the things that we need to consider when we talk about diabetes and the diabetes complications that we are going to briefly discuss today. Next slide, please. So after we talk to our patient about the physiology and the patient learns about the pancreas, and insulin, and how the cells capture insulin, and what is happening in a patient with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And when the patient needs to learn um, about complications, and we start with the list, we talk about the eye diseases, we talk about uh, patients can have heart damage or stroke. The first cause of death for a patient with diabetes is a heart attack. So all those things are overwhelming for patients. Then we need to go to chronic, um, to chronic kidney disease. Then we need to talk about neuropathy. Then we talk about uh, arteriosclerosis. So by the time we get, we get to the fit, patient is over, overwhelmed with the information. So we need more than one, more than two, more than three appointments or visits just to talk to our patients and educate them about uh, this uh, particular issue. So if you see, if you start from, from the head to toe, I mean, the last one that you will see is the diabetic foot. And so let's make sure that we don't forget it because it's as, uh, this particular complication is as important as the other ones. And uh, sometimes we tend to omit it because we have other patients waiting, because uh, we have other administrative issues, because we had, uh, we need to uh, uh, send messages to our patients. Uh, uh, we need to fill out uh, the prescriptions. We, uh, and several things that are that are that are happening, and uh, if we are educating our patient, it's going to be very difficult to get it to 
to the diabetic foot and how they need to examine uh, the, the foot of, of the patients. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to stop for a moment uh, here. But before I do, I'm going to go over this slide because it's so overwhelming uh, when we educate patients and we just take a look at the diabetes self-management -man education curriculum. It has all kinds of information. Again, we need to, uh, the patient needs to understand what diabetes is, what the treatment options, why they need to start with uh, metformin, or um, why they, we need to go to with, uh, you know, uh, that this is a uh, disease that is going to evolve, that what is going to happen, and then uh, how the lifestyle, lifestyle changes that they have to make then uh, whether or not the medication is working or not and why it's working or why it's not working. Then uh, again, the acute and chronic complications. So by the time that we get to the chronic complications, uh, and again, if we go to the very uh, premise that I mentioned that uh, we can tend to forget the 80% of what we learn in 30 days, this is something that we need to keep keep talking to our patients until they understand the importance of this particular issue. I'm going to stop for a moment. I will turn it over to Chantel because before we get into the uh, uh, nitty gritty of the conversation, uh, we have some uh, we have an interactive activity for all of you. Thank you, Dr. Leon. Um, my name is Chantel Moore, and I'm the communications manager for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. Today, we are going to um, open up with some questions and let's see. The code is you would need to go visit menti.com and the code is 11556794. Getting a few people giving a thumbs up so people are logging in. It's also available in the chat if you need to just copy it and paste it for more efficiency. And as we go through the presentation, the code will also be at the top of the slide if anyone wants um, needs to join then. So we have some opening questions. What percentage of patients with type two diabetes will eventually develop peripheral neuropathy? Would it be 10 to 15%, 20 to 30% or up to 50%? Right. The correct answer is up to 50%. Next question. What is the lifetime risk of a foot ulcer in patients with type 2 diabetes? Is it 10 to 18%, 19 to 34%, or 35 to 50%? In other words, up to 50%. All right, the correct answer is 19 to 34%. And our last question, what percentage of patients with type two diabetes could develop a foot ulcer that could develop a lower extremity amputation? 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%? All right, the correct answer is 20%. Good job. So I'm, you guys can please stay logged into Mentimeter and I'm going to pass this presentation back to Dr. Lamb. 
Thank you, Chantal. And uh, the purpose of this exercise is to see how prevalent this uh, chronic complication is. Uh, we tend to forget, again, um, what is happening in our patients, uh, specifically in regards to amputations. In the United States, the three main causes of amputations are a neuropathy due to diabetes, uh, a trauma, and, and the last one is cancer. So let's keep in mind that patients with diabetes uh, are more likely to suffer an amputation if we do not control the uh, sugar levels in their blood. So let's keep an eye on that. Next slide, please. So uh, this is related to what Chantel just uh, um, did for us, this interactive activity. And Chantel was saying that the lifetime risk of developing diabetes foot ulcer in patients with diabetes is 19 to 34%. Uh, the literature says between 20 to 25, others mentioned 19 to 34. So that's uh, what we have. And uh, that's the latest information that we have from the American Diabetes Association. Remember again, that we are talking about other uh, conditions, uh, uh, about other complications that we also need to discuss that with our patients, the, the retinopathy, the patient can develop cataracts, patient can develop uh, you know, kidney problems and cardiovascular disease. And uh, when you have 19 to 34% of uh, risk of those developing uh, a diabetes foot ulcer, uh, that is a large percentage of of, of patients with diabetes. And then 20% uh, of these patients who develop an ulcer will require a lower limb amputation. And that's the reason why this is so important. And then you can see the uh, incidence is increasing. Uh, for the last five to 10 years, there has been a, uh, an increase in the number of amputations due to, due to diabetes. Next slide, please. On top of that, we have a patients um, that have risk factors, and, and there are some patients that are more likely to suffer neuropathy and therefore uh, have a, a foot ulcer. But uh, if try to keep uh, in your um, mind or try to imagine a patient with diabetes, and you will see that uh, patients with type 2 diabetes tend to be obese, that uh, health centers are reporting that about 32% of their patients have uncontrolled diabetes, uh, was, which is uh, A1C greater than 9. In public housing, the number, the percentage is even uh, higher, it's about 34%. That patients have other conditions, uh, elevated cholesterol levels or hypertension. In public housing, uh, there was a hot initiative to ban smoking in public housing. And uh, according to hot data, 30 3% of those living in public housing are uh, tobacco users. And then there is family history. And then uh, something that we forget is uh, foot deformities. Since there will be more friction, then these patients with diabetes will tend to develop a uh, foot ulcer if we don't provide them with the, uh, with the education and the materials that they need. To, uh, so it is really important to inform them about all these uh, risk factors. Next slide, please. So there are several uh, several uh, uh, issues going on when you have a patient uh, with diabetes and this patient develop a foot problem or a foot ulcer in this way, in, in this case. First, and uh, what, what we need is a patient who has had uh, an A1C elevated, uh, poor control of their diabetes for many years. 
the patient is going to develop neuropathy. Uh, the patient will also develop some vascular disease. The problem with this one is patient with diabetes uh, because the, uh, they have poor circulation. Uh, they will be more uh, slow. Uh, if they have a, a, any lesion, the lesion is going to be uh, slow to heal. So this is a, another issue that we need to keep in mind. And then um, we mentioned that there are other uh, issues going on like uh, calluses or ingrown nails and uh, uh, some food deformities. And the last one is the infection. So uh, we will have all these concussions, then uh, we are going to have, our, our patients are going to have issues managing any problem with their feet. So before we get into a foot ulcer, we need to make sure that we provide the training, we will provide the education and the uh, resources and materials that our patients need. Next slide, please. So there are several things affecting our patients, the most important uh, patients experiencing diabetes. First, uh, we mentioned some of the uh, risk uh, conditions, uh, either the, uh, I mean, more likely, uh, this is something that is more likely to happen in patients who are current smokers or if the patients have hypertension or any dyslipidemia. But uh, we need to also have uh, a, a neuropathy and uh, some patients have micro and ma macrovascular conditions. All these, as I mentioned, is, are going to reduce the tissue nutrition, and they're going, is, this is going to pro, pro, uh, the, the uh, end result is going to be that they will develop is, ischemia and ulceration. But also, uh, the main the main culprit here is the uh, diabetic neuropathy, and then it will be uh, an ulceration due to these patients are don't feel the same way that we feel a pain. So patients can have all these issues and they don't even know that they have it or they don't notice until it's too late. And then at, at, at the bottom, we have the infection. Any microorganism will get into, into the ulcer and the patient is going to develop an infection. And uh, the issue with this is that there are so many uh, infections going on. And as we know, uh, there are Patients with di with diabetes are do not um, do not uh, respond uh, to treatment the same way that others respond because other issues can happen. Uh, if a patient has some uh, kidney issue, um, we need to be very careful with the dosage of the uh, antibiotic that we are offering. You know? And so there are several several things going on at the same time. So before we get into the foot ulceration and then the amputation, let's make sure that, again, we provide the education uh, uh, that our patients need. Next slide, please. So the other issue happening with patients with diabetes is that these patients are more likely to develop atherosclerosis. Uh, there is a micro and mass, macrovascular condition affecting patients the patient are going to have an inflammatory process in the arteries. They will have what we call an intermittent claudication, which is basically the patient is moving and then the patient uh, has pain. and They need to stop uh, walking, so they need to rest. So, so uh, uh, blood um, is back you know to the leg at the pair there is enough oxygen so they can feel uh, then then they feel better and they start walking again so uh, in addition to that uh, because of age related issues patient can have uh, some venous insufficiency and uh, we are going to what we are going to see is uh, a swelling in the lower extremity uh, some discolorations and some development of wounds that are slow to heal next slide please As we mentioned, uh, the, uh, the peripheral artery disease is uh, also something that we need to consider when we talk to patients or, or when we have patients with, uh, with diabetes because as we mentioned, uh, neuropathy, uh, arteriosclerosis, and um, uh, all these are going to be uh, issues that are going to affect our patients and therefore we are going to have uh, uh, um, 
uh, we need to make sure that we educate the patients about these chronic conditions as well, so they do not develop an, an, an ulcer or an infection. So uh, if the patient is experiencing some uh, peripheral artery disease and the patient is talking about claudication, intermittent, intermittent claudication, then the patients are going to need vascular testing, referral to a specialist, and uh, a walking program. Next slide, please. So let's go back to the uh, peripheral neuropathy, which is the main cause of foot ulceration. Um, and this is uh, something that we need to also consider that 60 to 70% of our patients experiencing diabetes will have some form of neuropathy, that it takes time to develop uh, the neuropathy. It's not something that is going to happen once we diagnose, or it will depend on when the patient uh, was diagnosed with diabetes and whether or not uh, the patient is uh, controlling their sugar levels. So uh, it happens over time. The patient is going to have some numbness, uh, burning, electrical sensation, altered sensation of hot, cold, and many more. And they will have some inability to walk and we will have some balance issues. Uh, also, one of the, the uh, when, when we examine the foot of, or the feet of our patients, we need to see that how they, uh, uh, hold the fit and the, the, whether or not there is any ulceration, whether or not there is any deformity. So all are the things that we need to talk to our patients and they, they can do the self-exam or um, themselves. That, that's something that we can talk later. Next slide, please. So again, uh, there will be some uh, issues on how the patient walk. Specifically, we are talking about the, um, the uh, peripheral artery disease that can affect our patients. Remember that we have patients that um, this is a condition that is going to develop over time. Uh, we are going to have senior patients that they develop any other co uh, conditions such as arthritis, for instance. And then that's going to uh, be uh, another issue that we need to consider that is going to be a, a risk factor for patients uh, with diabetes and uh, making sure that we see how they walk, uh, the stands, whether or not they have any pain. All those things are really important and really uh, important to mention to our patients uh, that we need to let them know if you feel pain or if you have any problems of walking or you have any issues, or you have any pain while you walk in, that's something that you need to let us know, that you need to report. It may be related to their diabetes, and please come to the clinic. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of things uh, in regards to amputation. Again, uh, this is just one of many um, resources that we can that we can mention and uh, how we can uh, uh, assess whether or not the patient is going to need amputation or what is going to be the outcome. Uh, there are several uh, organizations that have their own uh, assessment. Uh, this is uh, one that I really like, but uh, American Diabetes Association, so the uh, Association of Endocrinology have a different different uh, assessment tools for our patients. Next slide, please. What we have to think about um, when we talk to our patients, and these are questions that we need to ask the patients, is do you have numbness or loss of sensation in your feet, uh, whether or not they have any uh, circulation problem. And we are going to see some slides regarding the scheme that we can measure the circulation. The patient can let us know whether or not there is an issue with their circulation, then whether or not they have history of uh, foot ulcer in the past. Uh, important, the type of shoes that they wear. Again, uh, in community uh, health centers or FQACs or health center programs, um, we have migrant and agricultural workers uh, working all day, probably not using or um, uh, the tools that they need or not wearing the shoes or the socks 
that they need, uh, you know, to take care of their fit. So this is something that we need to also uh, take into consideration when we talk to our patients. And again, uh, uh, talk about any uh, deformity. You, and even if you are not examined because you are not the provider, you can talk to a patient and the patient can say, yes, I have this issue, I have this other issue. And then let them know that by just by having a foot deformity, they are more likely or they're more prone to developing any uh, issues with their feet, uh, and specifically if they have uncontrolled diabetes. Next slide, please. Also, we need to provide our patient with the ABC. Um, the A1C it has to be measured every three months, depending on whether or not uh, these patients have uh, uncontrolled diabetes, otherwise every six months, as recommended by the American Diabetes Association. Check the blood pressure to uh, making sure that there is no other cardiovascular disease that is going to affect the circulation of our patients and also check their cholesterol. So these are the ABCs that we also need to talk to our patients. Next slide, please. One of the biggest concerns is the structural racism and social determinants of health affecting those uh, living with diabetes or experiencing diabetes. And those, uh, if the patient has poor access to care, and we mentioned several reasons, Either the patients are working too hard, two or three uh, uh, places where they work, they don't have time to go to the clinic, or they are uninsured, or they are partially insured, they're more likely to develop ulcers, and they're more likely not to receive any uh, education or any treatment. And therefore, when they go to the clinic, it's too late, and we are going to have uh, um, amputations and the uh, uh, the likelihood of developing amputation is is uh, higher in patients who are low income patients or those uh, uh, suffering or being uh, uh, any of the social determinants of health and again uh, let's make sure that uh, um, that we talk about patients about the healing process about what they have to do the uh, patients who are uh, either uh, patient experiencing homelessness or patients uh, living in public housing or those migrant agricultural workers, uh, those are high risk patients um, because all the social determinants of health involved in this population. So let's make sure that in addition to the education, in addition to the um, talking to our patients about um, food ulcers and complications, uh, let's uh, also assess any uh, issue that they have, any social issue, any economic issue, so we can provide a very uh, holistic approach. Uh, otherwise, it, it, education is not going to be the only solution if we don't help patients with the other issues that they have that are not uh, health health related, but social or economic or financial related issues. Next slide, please. So the what we are trying to, to uh, avoid here is the lower limb amputation. This is the main concern when we have foot ulcers, specifically uh, in patients uh, being served by community health centers. And as, as, as a result, we need, to make, we need to make sure that we are always repeating the same information to our patients. Uh, sometimes we focus a lot on other uh, issues and it's totally, totally understandable. But at the same time, please uh, keep in mind that patients can't and do not uh, forget the, their, their, their fit because otherwise we can have uh, a patient uh, who have, or a patient who has um, been able to manage uh, other, other issues that the probably the patient is having no eye is, uh, no issue with their eyes, no heart issues and anything like that. But then uh, as we saw that there will be a, a, a large percentage of patients with diabetes who will develop neuropathy. And there is also a large percentage of those with neuropathy who are going to uh, need a lower limb amputation. Next slide, please. 
In regards to peripheral neuropathy, uh, it's mentioned that there are several ways that we can talk to a patient. First is education. Uh, there has to be a really good uh, glucose control, making sure that the patient follows the instructions, that the patient understand the risk, that the patient understand how to how to manage their diabetes and how and, and how to uh, stay away from uh, other risk factors like smoking or drinking alcohol and all, everything else that can cause um, a peripheral neuropathy. And then uh, if the patient is experiencing some pain, there are some medications that is mentioned the B complex can be useful. Uh, there are some pain management strategies, making sure that if the patient has any issue walking or if has any gait issue, the patient has a cane or a walker or walking stick just to make sure that we are helping and we are uh, offloading uh, the, the, uh, all the issues with our patient. And then the daily inspection of the fit, uh, I mean, that's something that we need to talk to our patient as well. And thank you, Francis. Yes, um, uh, for your comment, we need to look at the fit of the patients. We move the, the socks, in, the stockings, the, to the microfilament test is really important, as you mentioned. So thank you so much for that. Next slide, please. So an ulcer is not going to be there, you know, uh, uh, I go to bed tonight, I have diabetes, and tomorrow I will have an ulcer. Uh, that's not the way that happens. There is this is a long process, and there will be some warning signs. Uh, there will be, we know that the skin is going to be affected, that uh, there will be some issues. Um, uh, we didn't mention uh, the uh, Charcot, the Charcot foot, uh, foot but that's uh, something that the patients are going to report. Um, sometimes we believe it's a cellulitis, it's another issue, but in reality is that the patient is having a neuropathy and there is no infection, there is no fever. So we need to keep that in mind, but uh, patients are going to have some uh, symptoms and some signs even before they develop an ulcer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we need to remember that the skin is the largest organ that we have, and the, the function is to protect, it's a barrier. So um, anything that can uh, be a factor that can uh, disrupt this protective barrier can be a cause of an infection, and we have an ulcer, then um, and the patient has diabetes, that's going to be a big issue. So let's make sure that we mention patients about other uh, conditions, uh, whether or not there are um, uh, uh, a fungus, a fungi uh, infection, if there, whether or not there are ingrown toenails or there, if the patient has any other issues. So to all these issues we need to keep in mind uh, when we talk to our patients um, uh, with uh, diabetes. Next slide, please. Now, in regards to the daily care of the fit, uh, we can talk to our patient that every day they need to have a food inspection, making sure that they moisturize their skin, not between the toes, because that's a, a, a very uh, humid area and that can cause an infection. And uh, the use of antifungal creams is, or powders are really uh, uh, important if the patients are experiencing any infection. Um, the is if there is an ulcer, uh, the recommendation is never suck uh, the the foot if the patient has an ulcer, and uh, refrain from barefoot walking. So all these are recommendations that we can provide to our patients. Uh, there are a lot of uh, resources that we can use. Uh, the Center for Disease Control has a page dedicated to uh, educating patients on this particular issue, as well as the National Institute of Digestive, of the Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disorders. Next slide, please. So these are the, uh, the uh, cascade of, of how the patients are going to develop gangrene, and therefore, uh, if the, this is to advance, uh, the patients are going to have an amputation, but there will be several issues going on that, that are going to happen. There will be repetitive trauma, 
the repetitive trauma is going to cause the tissue destruction. And because there is poor circulation, uh, the patient is not going to heal up, uh, properly. And uh, we can have a secondary infection, develop the gangrene, and then uh, the end result is going to be um, uh, uh, that the patient will need a, an amputation. Next slide, please. So uh, there are several um, treatments, uh, recommendation for diabetic ulcers. Uh, this is not the um, goal or the objective of this uh, webinar, but let's make sure that uh, one of the things that we need to talk to the, our patient is the offload, offload of the pressure area. We talk about walkers or, or canes or anything that the patient can uh, use. You know, it's not because otherwise there will be a repetitive trauma and then um, there will be, the patient will not heal properly. Next slide, please. These are, again, uh, the, the how is the, the disease evolved, what we need to do. Uh, sometimes uh, the wound care and the offloading are not going to work. Uh, the patient is going to develop um, an infection. The patient is going to develop, uh, they will have to uh, need to be hospitalized. The patient will need surgery. And um, after the surgery, if there is no amputation and if there is uh, good debridement and if the patient gets better, well, then we need to talk again about the prevention of the recurrence. And so this is a, a, a circle that we need to keep in mind. And uh, I, the idea is not to get to the hospitalization so the patient can uh, uh, avoid all these complications just by uh, following the instructions that you can provide and the education resources that you can give to the patient. Next slide, please. So uh, this is how uh, the condition evolves. Uh, we have a patient with a foot ulcer the patient is going to have uh, an infection of the soft tissues, and then there will be an infection of the bones, and then the patients are going to develop gangrene. And therefore, I mean, if we don't have, if depending on, on the level of infection, the level of gangrene, then the patient is going to either uh, recover or the patient will suffer the lower limb amputation. Next slide, please. Again, uh, this is uh, the same, just uh, showing the different steps in order for a patient to get uh, an amputation uh, specifically uh, for the topic that we're covering. We're talking about patients with uncontrolled diabetes who develop a neuropathy. Uh, the patient is not well uh, controlled. The patient is going to develop ulceration and ischemia. There will be an infection. And the last step is uh, that we will have to amputate the patient. Next slide, please. So uh, important is the foot screening. Um, we just uh, received the feedback uh, from Francis regarding uh, all the steps and what we have to do. There are some foot screen assessments that you can find. Uh, we are going to share these slides. So if you don't have any and you are planning to talk to your patient, see whether or not um, you have uh, the patient have everything covered, uh, all the talking points that you need to have with the patients. This is extremely important. It's going to uh, help the patient, as, uh, uh, the, the health educator, the diabetes educator or the clinician assess the risk of the patients. Uh, you know, um, if the patient is a person who can develop a, a neuropathy or or an, uh, a foot infection on, on, on an ulcer. Next slide, please. So uh, the recommendations for the uh, Association of Podiatrists is uh, let's talk to a patient on how they, uh, the need that they have to shed your, uh, the, the feet every day, how they wash your feet every day, that they never need to go barefoot that uh, they need to trim their ton toenails straight across. That's another concern for patients with diabetes. And um, all these are really good recommendations and something that is simple to talk to the patients. It will require just to keep talking uh, about them uh, and the use of uh, talks, as Francis is saying as well, 
uh, there are some uh, socks for patients with diabetes. So this, those are things that you can find over the counter at any uh, uh, drugstore. So let's make sure that we uh, assess the patient and keep repeating over and over all again uh, the recommendations. Next slide, please. There is another uh, document. This is from the American Academy of Family Practitioners. Um, we've been talking about the foot, how to take care of the foot and how patients need to examine their feet. Uh, but there's also something that we need, uh, as we sometimes forget, and, um, and patients need to learn how to uh, properly uh, fit their, uh, their shoes. This is very important because the shoe can be, you know, uh, if the patient has a deformity, the uh, reason why the patient can develop an ulcer. So let's make sure that uh, we provide all these recommendations to patients, making sure that they understand the need, making sure that they know that how, how the type of shoes that they have to use and how they have to measure. And if they can, they need to go to a place where, where they can see a professional and help them with even something as simple as this can prevent patients from developing any uh, uh, issues, you know, with their, with their fit. Next slide, please. Also, uh, some warning signs and uh, everything that we need to talk to our patients. We have already talked about how to take care of their fit, but now uh, let's make sure that we also mention when they need to see the doc, when they need to go back to the clinic, even if it's not time for them to go to the clinic. Uh, one of the mistakes of our patients is that sometimes they say, oh, I have an appointment in a month or in two months. You know, sometimes that is not since uh, since uh, the neuropathy and the complication of the diabetic neuropathy or diabetes neuropathy uh, uh, is that some patients uh, do not feel any pain by the time they get to the clinic is too late and instead of going to the clinic and receive uh, uh, some treatment uh, some outpatient treatment the patient needs need, uh, needs to be hospitalized so. Let's talk to them about when they need to see the doctor as well. Next slide, please. So we have an educational video, uh, something that you can also mention your patient, uh, something that you can talk to them. Uh, this, uh, this video is from the Mayo Clinic, if I'm not mistaken, and it's really, really useful when you are talking to patients with diabetes and how do they can take care of their fit. Uh, can you play the video, Peter, please? Your feet work hard every day. People with diabetes should be vigilant about proper foot care. Foot care is really important for people with diabetes because of the risk of a diabetic foot infection, which typically starts with a peripheral neuropathy. Mayo Clinic Dr. Elizabeth Cozine says peripheral neuropathy is a common complication of diabetes. It means nerves in the foot are damaged and people can't feel pain. Some diabetics also have poor blood flow to the feet, which slows healing. So if they have a minor injury, there's a possibility of it turning into a major injury or infection. The following five tips can help people with diabetes keep their feet healthy. Inspect and wash your feet daily. Be careful when you trim nails, wear properly fitting shoes, don't go barefoot, and take steps to manage your diabetes by eating right, exercising, monitoring blood sugar, and regularly taking your medications. And if you do notice any sores on your feet, act fast and see your health care provider. For the Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Fide. So, uh... This is a, this is a really a really good uh, way to to summarize what we have discussed in fifty nine seconds. They summarize the entire webinar, so I, I really like the videos and they are very useful when you're talking to a patient. So, but um, do we have a case study, uh, Chantel? You can take it over from here and. Uh, uh, this is extremely important to just to make sure that we have uh, got the basics, you know, on the objectives of this webinar. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. So we're going to begin our case study with a patient named CT. So CT is a 68-year-old man with a three-year history of impaired glucose tolerance. 
His other medical problem is hypertension treated with a small dose of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. He quit smoking 20 years ago and he has no dyslipidemia and has had stress electrocardiograms every two years with normal results. He uses no alcohol. He is retired from an office job with the government and presently teaches part-time at a local college. His glucose intolerance was discovered on routine laboratory testing. He was sent for diabetes education, learned home glucose monitoring, and followed a diet and exercise program suggested by a diabetes educator. He was not obese and led a physically active life, playing golf frequently and taking vigorous walks almost daily. He lost 10 pounds and was able to normalize his blood glucose levels with this regimen. Approximately three months ago, he noticed some burning and tingling in his feet. He admitted that he had not felt as well as usual and that his walking was becoming more of a chore. He denied chest pain or shortness of breath. He denied any other symptoms and had no fever or chills, cough, bloody stools, or hematuria. When seen in the office, he had gained five pounds. His physical examination was normal except for some hyperesthesia of both feet as well as decreased vibratory sensations. So what type of chronic complications is this patient experiencing? Okay, peripheral neuropathy. All right, we're going to proceed to the next question. And uh, that's the right answer, uh, Chantel. My apologies. What recommendations do you have for this patient? So if you guys can answer it in the chat, um, what recommendations would you have for this patient based off of his symptoms? We can use the chat box if you have any uh, recommendations for this patient who has started to develop neuropathy and having some issues um, based on the discussion that we had, uh, what would you recommend to this patient? Well, based on the conversation that we had, uh, we need to start educating our patient uh, regarding the symptoms of neuropathy, making sure that we talk about uh, how this patient can take care of their feet, uh, talk about the warning signs, anything, any infection, uh, any uh, something that uh, they have that is not right, if the patient has any deformity, uh, that we can provide them with uh, uh, the assessment tool that we mentioned. We can also talk to the patient uh, regarding uh, um, the uh, other issues such as deformities and if this patient is having any uh, other uh, issue when the patient is walking, recommending to, to use a, a, a a cane or a walker, and very important is that if the patient hasn't had a foot exam, uh, 
let's ask the patient to either go back to the clinic, to the health center, or if the health center have access to a podiatrist, it's always a good idea to see a podiatrist. So all these are recommendations that we can provide to our patients and let them know that uh, a foot ulcer is a, a really serious complication because, because at the end, the patient can, can be amputated. Dr. Mayon, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Chantel, also for um, facilitating all the engagement activities that we did today. Um, so now if you have any questions, um, please uh, put them in the chat, or you can also do so by sending us an email uh, directly to us, either to Dr. Jose Leon at jose.leon at namgt.com or to me at fida.namgt.com or to Chantel Moore at cmoreanamgt.com. And this is just a kind reminder to everybody to please complete our post-evaluation survey. Um, this survey is gonna pop up on your window right after you log out from the Zoom meeting. And I do not see any questions at this point. Um, All right, thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. And if you have any uh, questions, if by any reason after the webinar, you, you say, oh, I forgot to ask this question. You have our contact information. Please feel free to send any questions to any of us. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you.